Welcome to the Scottish Rite Journal podcast, an audio presentation of the Scottish Rite Journal, brought to you by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, Mother Supreme Council of the World. This week's article is Masons at the Pallet, Masters and Apprentices in the Russian Empire by James Patrick Green, 32nd degree, and comes from the March-April 2023 issue of the Scottish Rite Journal. Freemasonry counts among its ranks many of the most talented authors, musicians, and artists of the past three centuries. This fact also rings true in the case of the Russian Empire, where Freemasons occupied prominent positions in the imperial court, published their literary works, and created much of the visual art that illuminates our understanding of 18th and 19th centuries in Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, and the Baltic states, the lives of three painters illustrate how Freemasonry attracted masters of the fine arts to its ranks, with knowledge and artistic skills passed from master to apprentice both within and without the lodge. Dmitry Grigoryevich Levitsky, 1735-1822, was born in Kiev and trained by his father, who was both a priest and an artist, leaving for St. Petersburg in his early twenties. He apprenticed under the portraitist Alexei Antropov, his career reached its crescendo after he received the title of Akamedician in 1770. His most famous works are his portraits of the Empress Catherine II and leading members of the Russian court. Levitsky received the three craft degrees at the end of 1797 on the recommendation of his friend and prominent Freemason, Nikolai Novikov. He also participated in Freemasonry beyond the third degree, later receiving the degree of Scottish Rite Master and the theoretical degree. He was a member of Dying Sphinx Lodge in St. Petersburg. Born to a Ukrainian Cossack family in Mirhorod, Vladimir Lukich Boravakovsky, 1757-1825, likewise studied painting under his father. The Empress Catherine was so impressed with his work on her palace in Ukraine that, in 1788, she had him sent for further training and patronage in St. Petersburg. In the then capital city, he apprenticed under Levitsky and other masters of portraiture. His most famous works include portraits of the imperial family and other members of the aristocracy. Surrounded by Freemasons in the late 18th century St. Petersburg, he likely became one himself in 1802, following in his master's footsteps. The path that led Alexei Gavrilovich Venetsyanov, 1870 to 1847, to create visual masterpieces differed starkly from that of his predecessors. Born to a merchant family in Moscow, he chose a standard track in the imperial civil service and pursued painting as a hobby. Taking night classes at the academy with Boravakovsky and studying the masterpieces at the Hermitage, Venetsyanov balanced his professional and artistic drives until 1811, when he decided to focus fully on painting. In 1815, he purchased a rural estate halfway between St. Petersburg and Moscow in a settlement now named after him, Venetsyanovo. Venetsyanov would go on to create works in a realist vein inspired by scenes of peasant life on his estate. He would later create an art school on his estate, with some of the students being those same serfs he portrayed in his paintings. Venetsyanov also was initiated into Dying Sphinx Lodge in 1821. In this brief survey of the painters Levitsky, Boravakovsky, and Venetsyanov, we have seen that Freemasons attracted artists and intellectuals in the Russian Empire just as it did in Western Europe and North America. In future issues of the Scottish Rite Journal, I will offer further vignettes from Russian imperial history that demonstrate the cultural importance of Freemasonry in Eastern Europe. As an added feature to this Scottish Rite Journal podcast, I had the privilege to speak with Brother James regarding his article. Hope you enjoy it. Was Freemasonry an all-inclusive fraternity in Russia, or was it just left to the aristocracy and those working in the imperial royal court? So we have a variety of, of takes on this, but at, at the end of the day, it sort of comes down to this. Uh, society in imperial Russia was highly, highly stratified. So we had a very small amount of people at the top uh, working in, in various positions in the government as nobility, whether hereditary or, or uh, otherwise. And, 
this is a very small slice of the population and a great majority of Masons in Russia were pulled from this slice, right? So we understand Freemasonry as requiring its members to say, read and be able to communicate in writing. And in Russia, even among the nobility, this was not a, a common thing. You know, literacy was very, literacy, <laughs> a very small a portion of the Russian population was literate, I'd say, up until even the, the Soviets took over. And, including and, the aristocracy? Yeah, including the aristocracy. Wow. Yeah, so the, the Russian reading public wasn't uh, developed. And we see in the 1760s and 1770s, uh, this guy Novikov come through, and, and he's a publisher, and he attempts to um, engage with the Russian reading public by publishing things for children, publishing uh, religious manuals, publishing a whole variety of things. And he's one of the main um, Masonic figures in this period as well. And I, I hope to cover him in, in the next article that appears in the, in the journal. But yeah, so we do see some very small numbers of craftsmen or merchants or other people who don't belong to the nobility in, in Russian Masonic lodges, but Honestly, a lot of those people are also not Russians. So they're they're Germans or they're English or you know they're coming from other parts of Europe. But the Russians, like ethnically or, or Russian speaking, mm -hmm. very strongly come from the nobility. So mouth to ear was was heavily relied upon. Yes. I mean, I'd say for for that one, yeah, but Russians also imported Masonic practice largely through the written word, as far as I've been able to tell. So I, I'd say it was, you know, what do they call it in the Scottish Rite? They call it communicating degrees. So they right. they had degrees communicated to them when they were abroad, say, in, in Germany. And then they communicated these same degrees to other Masons simply through reading the manuals they were given. You mentioned in the article the Boravikovsky was surrounded by Freemasons in the 18th century, in late 18th century St. Petersburg. He likely became one himself in 1802, following in his master's footsteps. Didn't sound incredibly definitive. Uh, were records lost to confirm his Masonic journey, uh, along with others through events later on in Russian history? Yeah, I really like this question, and I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. So for Borovikovsky, it was... Uh, the sources, like many historical sources, were not definitive, right? So for him, uh, the main source I lean upon is Tatiana Bakunin. She, she published this great source in French in, in the 20s and 30s, sort of listing every Russian Freemason she could find mm -hmm. and their dates of initiation or and who they knew and what they did. And... How she put it was the only thing she could find linking him to a Masonic Lodge was an entry in his journal saying that he chanced upon an encounter in a friend's house where he overheard a Masonic meeting. But later sources, like I think the Great Russian Encyclopedia lists him as a Freemason. I think they're drawing upon how uh, Masonic nobility or how the nobility in St. Petersburg during this period including, you know, his predecessor in art and his successor in art were Masons, were engaging with this Masonic philosophy, and they sort of just sort of jumped uh, to a conclusion there. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing definitive that we we have, say, on um, the other two artists, Le, Levitsky and Venetianov, but I think it's it's fair to say that there's a good likelihood, right? If they're having Masonic meetings around him and if he's just invited to somebody's house while they're having a Masonic meeting in the next room, right? you know, they're either not entirely tight-lipped about these meetings or he's already invited to them and welcome to be present at them. The degree of Scottish master and theoretical degree jumped out at me. I'd never heard of, of that before. And, and after a little Google research, I, I didn't find anything on it. To what are these degrees an equivalent to? That's a, another great question and, and also hints at some of the quirks of, of Freemasonry period uh, during this time frame and also Russian Freemasonry. So these degrees are connected in a large part to Rosicrucianism rather than Freemasonry 
in terms of the craft degrees or even the high degree systems. Mm -hmm. So the degrees of the, the Scottish degrees or the, the, the Andrews degrees were linked to the right of strict observance, which was practiced in Germany, uh, some Templarist rites in practiced in Sweden that emerged in the 1750s and 1760s. And at, at some point, these were transformed into, uh, I guess I would typify it as a Masonic order, or perhaps a paramasonic order called the, the Golden Order of the Rose Cross that had took as its base of initiates master masons or people within the Masonic system and then had the Scottish degrees, which were being practiced within regular Masonic practice in uh, craft system lodges as sort of a fourth or fifth degree, uh, maybe in a royal arch system. And then those who had achieved the Scottish degrees were allowed to take the theoretical degree which they thought as the midpoint between profane Freemasonry and a, a more mystical inner Rosicrucian system. And then uh, from the theoretical degree, you had a whole another set of steps, which limited the range of how many people were admitted to these inner mysteries and also created a, a sort of very stratified hierarchy between, say, the great mass of craft Freemasonry, which the Rosicrucian sort of derided as just a social club, mm -hmm. and, say, those who had held the Rosicrucian degrees who issued orders to uh, those below them. So I, I'd say, you know, when we say someone has the Scottish degrees, it's okay. They're not only interested in Freemasonry as just, you know, a social club, just having the a master mason degree and just hanging out with your friends but right. they're sort of interested in a more mystical inward looking branch of freemasonry and i'd say especially for someone who crosses over into the theoretical degree this is especially true did masonry in russia during any of this period experience any of the anti-masonic movement that was going on in the west yes and no right I, i'd say Russia has had more anti-Masonic years than it ha has had pro-Masonic years. Um, it's been under investigation multiple times during the empire. I mean, in the mid-century, they had the, the Tsarina had the police investigate. Um, the Empress Catherine the Great personally had a very mixed relationship with Freemasonry, but by the time the, the French Revolution really took off in the early 1790s, she curtailed it pretty swiftly. Her son, Paul, was a little bit nicer to it. So by the time she dies in 1796, Freemasonry begins to, to creep back into Russia and is allowed to exist in this legal gray area. Um, by the accession of Alexander, which is Catherine's grandson, Freemasonry really begins to blossom again. So in the, the 1810s, especially, we see Freemasonry blow up. Some historians ascribe this to, say, the the Napoleonic Wars, you know, Russian soldiers traveling into Western Europe and, and seeing Masonic practice and being like, you know, this is something we, we aspire to, which is a, a good point. And, but still within the reign of Alexander, and by the time Europe starts to have some of the revolutionary fervor, uh, left over in the 1820s, Freemasonry again sees itself repressed in Russia. In 1822, it's outright banned. All the lodges are asked to close. But it even before 1822, it had been pretty much under the observance of the, the state police. It, mm -hmm. it hadn't existed as say, an independent entity. So from 1822 until 1905, we think, you know, Freemasonry doesn't exist in, in a legal way in Russia. Right. You know, there's some whispers of like, okay, someone's still holding Masonic lodges in 1830s and 1840s, but right. you know how, how true this is, we're not sure. And of course, the Bolsheviks, once they take power, don't allow Freemasonry to right. operate. Well, and that was kind of had me thinking when, when, you, when a single word that you used, when you said they were asked to close, was it more of they were forced or were they actually asked to close? It was kind of like... Um, or. Since, <laughs> since Freemasons in Russia didn't 
weren't really terribly revolutionary. I think a simple ask did the job, right? Okay. I mean, if the if the czar asks you to resign from a post, you're not really in a, a spot to say no. So I, I suppose asking and forcing aren't really that that large of a difference. But violence wasn't necessarily used. They they sort of just shuttered their own operations and right. Went. So the three artists artists that you mentioned in the article, how active were they as Freemasons? And I guess some of that might, from what you've mentioned already, how you know, is there a lot of recorded activity? Or is there a lot of recorded information of their activity? Yeah. So, and and how active Masons are, you know, can you just judge that by their name on a lodge register showing up every meeting? You know, right. I like to think that a, a good way of judging that is is how engaged they were, perhaps, with the more Rosicrucian elements of Freemasonry, because I think that takes a greater level of devotion and you know mental self-study to to really achieve prominence in these Rosicrucian circles because they had to study they they were really engaged with each other in a form that more mimicked a, a religious experience and a masonic experience as we typically uh, understand it so they they treated each other as teachers they they confessed to each other they they formed each other's social circles mm -hmm. so the, the rosicrucian element i think was definitely the the biggest indicator of an alignment with masonic principles and activities and dying sphinx lodge which uh, was headed by a man named alexander labzin was one of these rosicrucian lodges so both levitsky and uh, veneziano belonged to dying sphinx uh, levitsky had a little bit more Masonic experience, you know, Veneziano was only initiated in 1821 into the lodge. So a year later, Masonry was banned. Right. I'd say out of the three, it seems Levitsky had the, the strongest Masonic ties. You mentioned the Dying Sphinx. Were the records of the lodge well preserved or destroyed after the rise of the Soviet Union? You know, uh, for, for once, and I hope one of the few times in my academic career, I will give the Soviet Union some credit in... in <laughs> saying that their archival practices were quite refined, right? So the Soviet Union wasn't in the best, uh, <laughs> it wasn't in the Soviet Union's best interest to keep records about its own atrocities alive, you know, so things about the gulag or or the uh, the purges, you know, we we struggle with records about that, even though records do exist and are are very present. But in the imperial period, regarding records about the imperial period, the Soviets were, were quite good at preserving those. Mm -hmm. And we can still find them in uh, our state archives in, in Russia and in Petersburg and Moscow. So, yes, the records do survive if the people that made the records decided not to destroy them. And that sort of is an interesting point where the Rosicrucians in Russia were instructed to destroy documents to destroy oh, wow. evidence of their membership. Now, to what extent this was followed varies based on member. We can say that a lot of members were really good at doing this. Um, some members were really bad at doing this. So when they were arrested, you know, ever the, the czar seizes their records. And then we we have this great sort of preserved idea of their, their organization, their members, their rituals and, and everything. Like and share this article, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you wish to comment, please leave one, and as a reminder, hit the notifications bell. Any accompanying photographs or citations for this article can be found in the corresponding print edition. The Scottish Rite Journal is published by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, Mother Supreme Council of the World, Mark Dreisenstock, 32nd Degree, KCCH Managing Editor. I'm your host, Matt Bowers.